All right, so go I would ahead. like to. All right, here's my note. I'm going to comment, but I won't go for an hour and 15 minutes. Go ahead. Demetrius Johnson is the newest fighter to come out and say they would like to be the co-main event on the Conor Floyd fight. In fact, he said that for his record-breaking 11th title defense currently held by Anderson Silva at 10 defenses, he would like to be on the co-main event of Conor Floyd. Does he have an opponent? Does he have anything else to to offer? No, you've got the note. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, okay. You know, you take a champion that's getting ready to, to to make history, and he's asking to be number two on a card that doesn't exist for a spot that he cannot and will not get. I'll leave it at that, and we can move on. Okay. Hey, speak, speaking of that, though, you, you read the news that uh, uh, Connor and Floyd apparently have uh, have a venue booked, what, June 10th or something, but they they booked a venue for that fight? I, I'm I'm staying out of this. I, you know, when I want to stay out of something, I always say the same thing. My name's Paul, and that's between y'all. I don't know which way this thing's going to go. I got a funny feeling that maybe it might it might happen uh, June 10th, but but I don't know. Dana White's being awful quiet. He's going to be on the uh, Colin show. The Colin the, Coward? No, not Colin. Uh, who's that other superstar? The late night host guy. Anyway, some redhead guy. I think he, he's he's Conan? part of, Conan. He's part of the alphabet, and uh, I think he's going to be on his show actually tonight. So, with news on this, or are you I, just commenting that he's going to be on that? He's going to be on the show. He's been quiet. Maybe All there's right. some news coming out he, tonight. He's not breaking. I don't know. He's not breaking sports news on a on, on a late night show. Those, those two won't be related. But uh, you know, I will weigh in on this. First off, I've always thought that fight was going to happen. I've told you that a million times. Uh, I think if they they booked a venue that isn't just for some kind of PR, I think they think that fight's going to happen. And Dana did make one comment, which was interesting, and he said that fight is nowhere near being done. Well, that's a tremendous, tremendous difference from that fight isn't happening. We've heard him say that fight's nowhere near being done, meaning people are at the table and we're, we're having problems and we're not getting something signed, but we're trying. And that's the same comment that he made now. And again, his only words were that fight's nowhere close to being done but that is so significantly different from no do you, uh, and when you take to the fact that they're trying to do Khabib and, and Ferguson again they're moving the division forward they're moving the division on in the absence of Connor it kind of makes you go well where is Connor you know he took a little break but that break is up and he's still not back I do think that that fight is going to happen I think the fact that anybody is weighing in that there's a contest there is such an incredible disrespect to boxing. If that fight goes more than 30 seconds, it shames boxing. If it goes out of the first round, it humiliates boxing. And if I was to tell you in any other sport that, hey, we got a great athlete from one field that's never done a sport before and he's going to come on and take on the, the, the best current living guy in that sport, it'd be laughed at. If I told you I got a guy who's never played basketball, sure, he's, he's you know shot the ball around and been on a court and had a ball in his hand, but he's never played a competitive game of basketball before, and we're going to put him up against LeBron James. It would be laughed at, and you could go, we've got a, we got a gal that's never played tennis before, you know, she's fooled around with the ball in the gym, but, ne- you know, never done it. She's going to take on Serena Williams. It'd be laughed at. And the fact that there's even an interest there, and I'm one of the people that shares the interest, but the fact that there's even an interest there is so disrespectful to the entire sport of boxing. And when that fight's done, Connor is going to go more than 30 seconds. He's likely to go more than one round. Shouldn't it? But he is likely to go more than one round. And it's going to humiliate boxing. Do you know how they can they can get this deal done? They just need to sign the paper. He's got to sign the paper. That's all you got to do, sign the paper. I got to tell you, again, I was impressed with Vitor. As as crazy as that sounds, a guy a guy forty years old, uh, he went out on his shield. That's what I'm going to say about Vitor. But with that said, I'm not sure that's not the best 185 pounder in the world right now. Yeah, or or, or 170 in KG. I got no problem with you putting Vitor over uh, one because I agree with you. I think he deserves it. You know, Vitor got clipped. He went down. He sprung his way back up to his feet. I mean, he went out there and he tried. And the other thing that I I really do like about uh, you know when you build up the guy that lost, is that's the only way you can understand and appreciate what KG did. We can't appreciate 
how good he is unless you understand his opponents. I remember when he beat Johnny Hendricks, which was really quite shocking in the MMA world. You know, right, Hendricks, the former champion. Uh, and people tried to say, oh, well, Hendricks is done, or Hendricks isn't paying attention anymore, or Hendricks isn't as focused. I'm going, wait a minute. Hendricks is a straight-up killer, and all you're doing by putting down Hendricks is taking away from Kelvin. That was a great Johnny Hendricks. It, the reality was Kelvin is this good. Can I stop you real quick? Yeah. Did, did you just name him KG, or is that something in the past? No, I got nothing to do with that. He's known as KG. Oh, I love it. I think because Kelvin looks like Kevin, and Gastelum's just hard to say. But yes, people call him KG. I get no credit for that. I love it. Yeah, so you know, KG goes out there. And, you know, not only does he beat Vitor, he does it in en- enemy territory. Not an easy thing to do. And the one thing about KG is he doesn't know anything about pressure. He doesn't know anything. Uh, he doesn't feel it. He doesn't observe it. He doesn't even know he was fighting, you know, Vitor at home and that that should have put pressure on him. Uh, and then the other thing, though, and you really have to pay attention to this, is he beat Vitor at his own game. You know, Kelvin is just a fighter. He, you couldn't say, well, this guy's a boxer, he's a wrestler, he's a jiu-jitsu ace. He's just an all-around fighter. And we've, we've talked about that, you know, what Luke and Tor told me on, uh, on the set of The Ultimate Fighter. When I looked at KG and I said, man, I don't know what it is you're good at. I, I don't know. But I also don't know where your weaknesses are. And Luke and Tor came up to me afterwards and they said, you want to know what he's good at? He's good at fighting. And it, just truer words have never been spoken about an athlete. He's just good at fighting. So to finish this thought, though, he goes out there against Vitor, the fastest, most accurate, hardest-hitting guy. If you were to put those three things together, he even trumps Anthony Johnson. He, When you talk, talk about the speed, the accuracy, and the power in his hands, it's Vitor. And Kelvin goes out and just boxes him and boxes him up, offensively and defensively. D- Vitor hit him with that head kick and came with a flurry. KG weathered it and just came back. I mean, offensively and defensively, he went in and beat a guy at his own game. But again, when you talk about the the ice running through his veins, you know, how calm he is out there, how he just goes out, how he believes in himself, is really quite remarkable. Because I still don't know what he's good at. That you can't teach that but calmness. But he's good at fighting. You cannot teach that calmness, that that slow, methodical not, I don't want to say slow because he's not slow, but boy, he looks he looks as relaxed as a guy, you know, going to church on Sunday. You know, he he is relaxed. No, hey, I, I want to weigh in on this real fast because I like what you just said about his speed. Now, Joe Rogan was commenting how you know that jab was lightning fast, and that is one thing about him. He's not overly fast. He is more methodical than he is fast. Uh, but every shot lands. He's got complete confidence. His defense is so solid. His defense is so underrated. Re- wrestling, jiu-jitsu, and in the striking realm. He's very hard to hit. He's very hard to take down. Nobody's come close to putting a submission on him, let alone finishing him. He's just so solid. And I like what you said about methodical. And he will turn it up. I can tell you this from even from sparring with him. Uh, he will go at a certain pace. And he'll let you go first. But if you up that pace... He's going to up it with you. And I've never seen an end in that, where you finally get him at the, at the highest end of his spectrum and he can't go any higher. He just keeps upping it. The guy's a killer. And when you say he might be the best middleweight in the world, he might be. Let's, and I'll listen to all the arguments, Jacques Array and Weidman, I'll listen to them all. However, he's also might be the one best 170-pounder out there. And you can't make that argument for wide men or Jacques, right? They couldn't get down to the weight class. Rock, you know, whoever you want to throw in there. So he's a very special talent. And then when you look at his age, 25 years young, and just turned it, by the way, youngest uh, champion in Ultimate Fighter history. And that was just yesterday. It was 2013, but that was just yesterday. We've watched him grow up. He is not in his prime. He won't be in his prime for another three to four years. And he might be the best fighter in the world. On his worst night, Joel, on his single worst performance he's ever had, he got a split decision against the current champion in, in Tyron Woodley. And I think it, I think that matters. Listen, I was going to go somewhere else, but let, let, let's stay on that pace. So, so right now, first off, man, let's just quit talking about 170 pounds. Let's just, there's no reason to talk about that. Okay, you're right. He's twenty five. He's twenty five years old. Why do you, why does he want to put his body through what is a traumatic experience? And that's that weight cut. If you're that good, okay. If you are that good in wrestling, Dakin Taylor had to run away from Burroughs. 
This guy doesn't have to run away from anybody. Now, now what the UFC has with this guy is they've got a headliner. They can all the shows they need. This guy, he just headlined a show. He could come back and headline another show in in three or four months. But here's your problem: at 185 pounds, you got Bisping and GSP. You got the champ and GSP out there with the un, unsaid date. You got Weidman and Musasi coming up. You got Jacare and Whitaker coming up. That leaves the number one guy, which is Romero, or Rockholt, Anderson, or Brunson in the top 10. So I guarantee the UFC wants to get this guy on a card and as soon as possible. I mean, he just ran through, he just ran through Vitor after running through Kennedy. Who do you put him with? Yeah, 185, who do you put him with? He called out Anderson. I got no problem with that. Uh, be great for KG. Don't know that it'd be great for Anderson, so I, I, I don't know that there's a huge matchup potential there. But I like that he called him out. I, I like that his mind's working in that direction. He's he's starting to control his own uh, destiny by saying who I want. Uh, I don't I don't really know who you put him with. I, I want to say this. My mind's still stuck on his weight, so I agree with you that he should stay at 185, make things more comfortable for himself. I will offer you uh, just as conversation that he barely makes 185. He is one of those guys, much like Anthony Johnson, where it doesn't matter the weight class, he's going to make sure it's hard for him to make. So there is something about still having 170 in mind that I think helps keep him disciplined, uh, helps keep him uh, within striking range. Uh, If you did just straight move him to 185 where he used to be, uh, he missed weight every single time. Uh, he had to come back for a second try every time, even if that meant just step back and drop his shorts and and re get on. So he he is a guy that kind of struggles there. Uh, that's the only, and I don't even know how much of a kryptonite that is because he he does make it. It's just a struggle. So I can't point to any other fault that he could possibly have. And I do know some guys that that, that weight also kept them on track discipline-wise. Some guys, they'd have to get an extra run at night to keep their weight down, but then that helped get them in better shape. They'd have to eat a little better, but then you know that helped them feel better for training, which got them better. He might be one of those guys, uh, but I, I can't think of anyone that can beat him, man. Listen, man, when they came up with the ingredients to Coke and they got it right and somebody drank that Coke and everybody loved it, they didn't change the ingredients. Okay, this guy, based on his last two performances, needs to fight at 185 pounds, and he'll fight whoever they put him up against. I say, listen, though, I say listen a lot. I actually like it. Hey, I say Romero's the only guy going to take that fight. I don't think Rockhold will take that fight, and Romero is going to be out seven, eight, nine months if he's sitting around waiting for a fight. I believe on that list, it's it's got to be Romero. Here's the problem there. If, if you're a promoter and you're going to put that fight on, you're taking your number one contender in Romero with your number one prospect. And again, it's because of his age. More than anything else, a promoter has to look at who's got the shelf life. Okay, KG is 25. I got a decade left with this stud. Let's sell some tickets in the long term. If I'm the promoter, I don't. you're eliminating a player. If you put Rockhold or if you put Romero rather versus KG, you're eliminating one of them, and they're both title contenders that can main event and, and headline an event. Uh, I want to put that matchup. I don't think that matchup will even be offered to him. But I hear what you're saying about in the rankings it making sense, and K- KG, KG's got no problem with it. I'll tell you that right now. I'm glad you mentioned the rankings. So, so KG comes out and cuts a promo. Kind of puts you over in the process. Says, "Hey, you know, a friend of mine's on a legend ass whipping tour, and uh, I'm going to finish it." And, and he calls out Anderson, who is just a little bit in front of him in the rankings. And they asked him about that, and he's like, "Listen, these rankings don't make any sense anyway. If you're not going to use them, they don't make any sense. You can't have GSP come fight for the title at 185 pounds if he's never been in that weight class. So you're starting to hear this a lot about the rankings from the fighters." What do you what do you do what do you do if if you're in that room with these guys and they're 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 complaining about the rankings? Yeah, well, so I get the argument, uh, and it's kind of bulletproof, and it is tough. You know, first and foremost, it's a business. You got to put on the fights that the people want to see, which is a nice way of saying the fights that are going to bring in the most money. 
That's what I have to do. Secondly, I love the rankings because it creates controversy. Anytime you put a number next to a guy's name, and people say, oh, I don't care about the rankings. You never meet a guy that's ranked number one that says that. Guys always care about the rankings, and they care about those numbers. They just can't believe them. If, if you're number one and everybody's saying you are, you can't accept that. You've got to keep striving to get better. If you're ranked number 10 and you want to be ranked number one, you can't accept number 10. You've got to keep striving and keep training and keep hungry there. So when the guys in the back create a, a unanimous dialogue that these rankings are off and they're not being followed anyway, that does have to be observed. But what do you do? You don't do away with the rankings. They're great. We're, we're making content out of it right now. I mean, the rankings are very helpful in every sport, largely because they create controversy and they create a dialogue. But, you know, secondly, I do understand if, if there's not a competitive architecture in place like a bracket, like every other sport has where there's a bracket and guys get seated and they're going to go out and, and, and prove who's better and have some opportunity to do that, they do become a little bit tough. And... uh so I, I get that argument. I get it. I get it on both sides. The rankings need to stay. Do we need to match guys up and and have them have a little bit more worth? Yeah, sure we do. 